Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to another episode of Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Today, I have a fellow uh, North Dakota State alumni, Kurt Bear. He is the founder of Loco think tank in Fort Collins, Colorado. His business creates small business owner peer advisory chapters in, at an affordable price by matching growth-minded members with give-back-focused business veterans in the role of low co-facilitator. Kurt started this business in 2014 as he attempted to navigate from a career in small business banking to a restaurant venture that never got off the ground. During two years in mobile food and two more as an investment and insurance representative, Loco grew steadily as a side venture. In 2018, Kurt went full-time loco. And in that same time, since he and his team have grown loco, think tank, to nine chapters in Northern Colorado, with with service offerings for all stages of the small business journey, they have expansion plans along the Colorado Front Range and beyond, and are growing at over 50% per year. Kurt is a self-described abundance-minded husband, adventurer, Christian, foodie, free thinker, rotarian, and libertarian. Kurt, welcome to the show. Thanks, Lance. Uh, that was uh, so quite. Uh, I really like that uh, that intro. A lot, lot of stuff to unpack. Let's start with growing up in North Dakota, um, and then how you found the Front Range. Yeah, that's a good good part of my story. Um, so I went to North Dakota State, as you mentioned, economics degree, and uh, my plan was at that time um, to come to CU Boulder and get an MBA, but I couldn't afford out of state tuition, and so I was just planning to move to Colorado on my credit cards and hope for the best, which probably would have been a disaster. But um, I took one job interview with a company called Community First National Bank, um, and they got hired into a, a lending, a credit and management training program. Uh, spent seven months classroom, a year in southern Minnesota, and then got to pick the community first bank that we'd like to go to. And they had acquired about 25 banks in mm-hmm. Colorado. What year was this? Uh, 1999. Oh, okay. So I landed in Fort Collins, Colorado, sight unseen in, in July of 1999. Wow. Had you ever been there before? Never. Never hey. been to Colorado. Seriously? Yep. That's incredible. Got here with a U-Haul truck and pulling my Pontiac Grand Prix on the trailer back. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. When I moved, when I was going to move down uh, my graduate year at, at uh, North Dakota State with architecture, uh, it was Alex and I did the same thing. Like he went to New York and I went, I, I came out to Colorado looking for jobs and uh, we had all these interviews lined up and it was 70 below. So spring break, quote unquote, in North Dakota, at North Dakota in Fargo, it was 70 below with the wind chill. And when we got here, I drove with my former wife, we got here and it was 70 above in March. And my aunt who used to live in Lyons. I was like, is this normal? She's like, yeah, don't tell anybody. Yeah. That, <laughs> I, I, the first day I got here, I was like, I'm never going to live in North Dakota again. Good for you, this man. Home. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, good. We're glad, glad you're here. Glad another fellow, fellow bison is happy, always happy to talk to, to fellow bison for sure. Um, tell us about loco because it's a really, and actually why, like what, what made you decide to go like banking isn't for me. I mean, it sounds like it's maybe just kind of somewhere to plant you for a while and then transition into loco. Yeah, when I first got into banking, I thought, well, I'll do this for five or seven years until I've got a really good idea and a pile of money saved up. Um, it became 15 years, and I never really did save a pile of money up. But banking got to be more and more um, work. Mm. Uh, it was kind of leisurely, big expense accounts and things like that. And what I really got a kick out of was making bets with other people's money on businesses that didn't deserve it yet. So I, I became really a good startup financer. And uh, you would recognize Green Ride Colorado oh, yeah. down here. Yep. Um, if you've been to Black Bottle Brewery in Fort Collins, that was one of my last startups. And and especially startups that got denied credit at other banks. And mm-hmm. if I could change their life and help them get off the ground, that was really my heart. And after the financial crisis years, it was clear that that was never really going to be allowed again. And uh, just federal regulatory oversight wouldn't let, especially small banks, yeah. uh, do those kinds of higher risk loans. Even though I was, I've really only had one $40,000 startup loan actually fail and not, not oh, no kidding. full. Yeah. Out of over a hundred. Can you unpack 
So two, two, two questions then arise from that is one, I would love to hear your best. And you don't have to name companies if it's, if, you, if there's an NDA or anything like that, sure. but I would love to just generally hear or, or specifically if you can best, best startup that you financed. Um, and then, and then why did the other one fall apart? And like, was it, was it a mistake that when you're in through your analyzation or, or was it just a combination of things? Um, so green red would have to be the best startup. You know, they, they had a 10, 12 year journey they started the company to compete with their former company that had been sold to a, a large international conglomerate, uh, Super Shuttle. Mm-hmm. And over the course of about five years, they went from 0% market share up to like 70% and Super Shuttle left the market. Um, they were getting crushed so bad. So they Super Shuttle bought a business for $3 million some dollars and then abandoned that oh, no marketplace kidding. because GreenRide kicked them out. Yeah. And then GreenRide eventually sold about two or three years ago to a, a larger regional company called Groom Transportation. Are they going to do it again then? Uh, I don't know if Groom <laughs> will. No, those guys are... At some point, you could, there's like a not, not to compete clause. I know Alex yeah. has worked with uh, some other, like he's advised on purchases of other architecture firms. Not not that we would buy them, but you know, right. he, was, he was helping with, he was sort of the in-between and an expert. And there's a not to compete, so I mean... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, and and I, I just uh, rode mountain bikes with Bob Flynn the other day, and and he's uh, in Newfoundland now. He's got a boat. He's got a Sprinter van. He's he's not going to work that hard again because it. Good for him. Regardless man. of how good your idea is, um, you know, there's times when you know he had to cash in some of his retirement, you know, and it was t- lean times for a while. He started right in the heart of the recession, but mm-hmm. um, whenever you make something successful, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears yeah. along that journey. So. Uh, if you're old enough and, and have enough uh, tucked aside, uh, usually people don't necessarily want to do that. And that's part of like part of the DNA of Loco Think Tank is people like Bob uh, that have had a successful small business journey don't want to do that again. They don't want to work that hard. They don't want to go through that much strain. But they do want to be involved in business because they mm-hmm. love it for its own sake. So that's kind of forecasting ahead. On the, on the WIF, you know, and all banking is largely... It's the it's the credit underwriting and stuff, but it's also are you betting on the right horse? And mm-hmm. in this case, I, I bet on a uh, landscaping. They were they were seeding uh, like doing uh, sod stuff where uh, dirt work had been done for construction and stuff like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, the guy just didn't, didn't have the the right skill set for understanding his costs and staying ahead of his financials and things like that. And uh, wasn't didn't have the connections in the industry that he portended to. Mm. And uh, just he just never built the revenues that he had to 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 make it work. Um, so it was a swing and a miss, um, and it happens. Yeah, one of our last episodes we did, and I would love to. Ask, I'm going to ask you this question: Is uh, how do you how do you go about telling somebody their business idea is is bad? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, you got to call the baby ugly if it's y- ugly. Yes. Um, and I do that a lot through a volunteer role at the Small Business Development Center. Um, and I used to get um. Like sometimes I'd be like, well, why is this person even coming in? They're never going to have a successful business. They don't have enough resources. They don't really have the skills that they think they do. And I've talked a lot of people out of trying a venture. Um, and, and Terry at the SBDC, uh, I was talking to her about this, and she said, you know, if you can save somebody from losing 50000 or $100,000 or their home um, by consulting them to, to pump the brakes... You know, or wait until you're at this place before you pull this pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. Um, you've done just as much service as if you allow somebody to create wealth. And uh, so that's kind of helped me just shoot people straight. Yeah. You know, and I do that with with staff. Uh, one of the first acts I ever did when I became a manager of people as a banker um, was let somebody go, and she was smart, funny, and she hated banking. She mm. was an artist and a painter and. She didn't like it at all. And then on her five-year anniversary of starting her own business, doing wedding photography and painting classes and things, um, she called me out for being the the best and shortest term boss she ever had. You know, so nice. just shoot people straight. Yeah. I think they deserve that. They're they're thinking people and, and individual action takers. And if you've got insight for them, just give it to them gently. Gently. Yeah. I, I think you can't just say your baby's ugly, right? Yeah, so. true. Yeah. <laughs> We, one of our values uh, is uh, at Loco is uh, uh, encourage and admonish with kindness. You know, because sometimes you do need encouraging. Uh, more often, a lot of times, we need admonishing. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, you need to take care of this, Lance. Mm-hmm. Why haven't you taken care of that yet? Mm-hmm. So, uh, but do it always with kindness. Yeah, yeah, great advice. 
uh, unpack, a, go a little bit deeper into Loco. Who, what, why, how, what you guys do. Sure. Um, so... And feel free to pitch. I know you put yeah. your notes here like yeah. not a commercial. No, this is, all, this is what it's all about, buddy. We're, we're, we're sharing is caring and all that. Well, and we'd love to have a chapter in Longmont and, and Denver and Boulder soon. And, and we are have the kind of the critical mass to support launches like that. But um, I was, while I was in banking and, and while I was an acting president, I became part of an organization called Vistage. And Vistage is a, a you know $1,400 a month club now or 1800 if you're in the bigger businesses. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in a trusted advisors group. And it's, it's really what we do, um, but very expensive and highly trained, two weeks of training to be a facilitator, a chair. Um, and so when I was leaving banking trying to start this restaurant, um, backing up a step, in my banking career, I noticed that all the best run businesses that had, were the most profitable, the, the owners had the most flexibility of their day, et cetera, they had something like this in their world, whether it was a high paid thing or a free thing that was self-organized. A lot of people do that, a mastermind group. Mm-hmm. Um, so I wanted that, leaving banking, and I had a former Vistage chair that was out of her non-compete. Andrea Grant is my co-founder, and one okay. of her former members was a longtime friend. And the three of us had lunch, and, and she had dropped Vistage, not because she didn't believe in it, but she struggled to sell it. She's an introvert more by nature, and it was pretty expensive for the smaller businesses that she was serving. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she had <coughs> said, well, I'll facilitate the meetings for a flat affordable fee and so Kurt you can I just charged $150 a month and rounded up my best business friends and had it so I could be around real business people because I was a banker I knew some things but I didn't know a lot of things yeah and and but I did have that banking skill that I could bring to the sauce so we just build diverse groups of small business owners that have kind of that diversity of background experience uh, things they're best at things they acknowledge they're not the best at and then one business veteran that's been there done that um, and wants to have a purpose fulfilling role mm-hmm. and they act as subcontractor facilitators. And so they run the meetings and they schedule time at the microphone for the various members. We go through a structured issue processing methodology and, uh, it just developed from there. Really, uh, I started another chapter a year later, uh, dropped the food truck, started another chapter. And then at the beginning of 2018, I, I hired my first intern to try to put some structure to what mm-hmm. was really just a relationship <coughs> relationship driven and uh you know a, a word document for an application and checks yeah. flying here and there and in the time since we've we've been able to build a lot of processes systems got a real database working and a killer website um i hired rory Shar uh, about a year ago and uh she's been made a big impact on our our visibility in the digital realm and and deb piles came on board last fall to help with just all the counting and sorting and billing and credit card renewals and just the stuff. Yeah. And uh, really just working toward f- figuring out how we can how we can scale this in other communities now. Is everything virtual at this point or do you guys have a little headquarters? Yeah, I've got an office right in Old Town Fort Collins and we've got a we just built out a conference space adjacent. Um, the chapters actually meet uh, in places what we call squatters rights. Mm-hmm. So the Innosphere in Fort Collins is a kind of a business accelerator. First Bank has hosted chapters. The Workforce and Economic Development Center thinks highly of what we do and say they host a chapter. Um, different members might have conference spaces. Uh, Best Western in, in Fort Collins is now hosting a couple. Um, we got invited not to uh, be in a lot of those places, which is part of why we built out the conference space um, mm-hmm. during the COVID stretch here. Our members still wanted to be together um, safely, mm-hmm. and uh, so we we did all virtual. Um, April, uh, some of our chapters in May came back. More in June, some have met outdoors. Um, it's really a, the facilitator is kind of the owner of their vessel, and so I don't get involved. I don't know what's going on in any of these groups. I don't know who's facing a marital challenge or mm-hmm. financial headwinds or lost their key employee. I'm just the guy that finds the the talented people, uh, which my banking career helped me with. And then also I kind of have that view of a business as a whole person. And so I'm, I'm looking for those various strengths to, to put into the sauce and, and make it so that every member we add adds to the to the quality of the whole group. And, and so it's also my job to kind of keep the bad apples out. People yeah. be there for the wrong reason or whatever. Yeah, sure thing. What, so uh, I... 
I hate to make the comparison, but I'll make the comparison is like we, we were in the chamber of commerce, right? Sure. What, what, what separates you guys from an organization like that? And then do you work in concert with them? Do they see you as a competing entity? Yeah. Good question. Uh, no, we're not the same at all. Um, okay. Chamber is really about networking. Yeah. And in fact, we're anti-networking. Um, you have to clear it with your group before you do business with a fellow member. Oh, interesting. Um, because it could create a conflict of interest. If if somebody hires you to do their architecture for their house mm-hmm. and you go in 40% over budget and, and, and don't get the permits on time, you know, there might be a problem that you can't sure. be transparent together later. So it doesn't mean don't go buy a pizza from each other. And it doesn't even mean don't do business, but be eyes wide open as to the potential for conflict. So Chamber loves us. Um, shout out to the Fort Collins Chamber. They've been yeah. great in uh, referring you know, potential prospects to us. They don't do what we do. We don't do what they do. And uh, we're, we're that way with a lot of organizations. We're uh, Realities for Children and, and Good Business Colorado. And for the most part, even the, and the Small Business Development Center, um, they host some of our chapters and our facilitators, our consultants with them. And, and sometimes we refer people for their other services that aren't ready for Think Tank yet that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. we're, we try to be collaborative within our groups and with everybody else that we work with. We just want to be everybody's friend, kind of. Yeah, why wouldn't you? Right. Absolutely. Like, I mean, I know I know there's a, you're not supposed to network, but eventually, I mean, essentially you you are networked with people, right? What is uh, what is it like when, how, forming a chapter, right? So like, I think mm-hmm. Fort Collins, is Fort Collins about 100,000 people right now? Is it more yeah, than that? Yeah, maybe 150. Now? Okay, you guys, yeah, I thought so. It's probably bigger. Yeah, Long one's about 100K right now. Okay. Boulder, um, just to give some reference for the listeners about, you know, chapter, like, what, how big is a chapter size then in a community about our size? And then when you go to select or find people, you know, are you looking, you talked about diversity, like, are you looking for, my wife is in a couple of these different kinds of groups and she's mentioned, you know, there can only be one commercial, commercial realtor, another residential, one architect, one engineer, uh, you know, one start, whatever, stuff like that. Right, how, right. What, how does, how does your, how does that work? Yeah, we definitely, because there would be a conflict if you had two architects in there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we just, like just this week, we we have a, a member of a chapter that's a pest control company. Um, and then uh, another prospect ha- has a lawn service company, but the lawn service company also does mosquito control. You know, so sorry, it's just mm. a little too close. We're going to have to wait. But yep. So forming a chapter, there there's what we've done in the past what i've mostly done in the past has been to get so chapters are they start with seven we cap them at 12. oh okay um so everybody's got enough wow that's free ex- space that's process. exclusive and then one per town no uh we've got nine in fort collins oh incredible yeah we had one in loveland we unfortunately had to fl- fold it down mm-hmm. um during the covid season and kind of merge some of those members into fort collins just to keep them served mm-hmm. um but yeah no and that's because i've got all my relationships in fort collins and the way we've formed groups in the past isn't the way we're going to form groups in the future i think uh, and that's part of a outcome of covid that, sure. that we can we can talk about the loco underground in a bit but so historically it's it's been me Knowing smart people through all my banking years, uh, I've, I think I've got over 4,000 people that I can know and shake their hand and call them probably by name or at least should know their name these days. Yeah. A lot of them are business people, business network people. Um, and so I would find a facilitator that wants the role um, and then at least seven member prospects that know enough about me and, and what I've described so far that they're at least curious. Um, but I, I say it's kind of like forming a seven-way arranged marriage. Mm-hmm. because when you ask them if they want to be in it, everybody's like, well, maybe who else is in who it? Who else? Yeah, sure. And so they have to all meet each other, do some interacting, see if I've brought some quality to the table and people that are ready to work on themselves and their business and grow. And, uh, and then it's a, a say yes moment. And we just formed a new chapter for the, the key employees of, of some of our members and not our members uh, last month. And, and so we had that moment again, we launched another group back in February that was uh, the same kind of thing where you're like, Okay, every, what do you guys think? You know, is everybody in? Um, but in Longmont, in Boulder, in Denver, we don't. I don't have those kind of depths of relationships mm-hmm. or credibility. Um, you don't know me at all. You probably wouldn't even go have a drink with me. Well, you might after this. But um, in in those markets, we were thinking we would have big events. Yeah, um, we've got enough financial horsepower that we could have a thousand dollar event without Kurt missing his mortgage payment next month. Now, finally, um, but obviously COVID and then, but what we've done now is create the local underground. And so basically for half of the cost of a monthly membership dues for your size of business, um, you can just have a one-on-one engagement with 
the local facilitator that will, once they get to seven, sprout that chapter up from Got underground. It. Everybody's price doubled, but you get that additional four-hour uh, peer advisory meeting. That's really the, that's the power of it. The facilitators, they're not business coaches; they're business veterans. Um, they're they're not a, they're not a teacher; they're a mentor mm-hmm. kind of, and so they don't have all, local think tank doesn't have all the answers. We have the process. It, it, yeah, exactly. So talk about that. Maybe, maybe that's kind of what I would like to boil this down to. Is sure. So I I I, I, I love the idea of mentors. People have asked us to be mentors. I consider this podcast being a being a mentor to to the masses and stuff like that what what is what is what is the 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 the, maybe the top three benefits that happen when you if you join a loco Mm -hmm. think tank um you know is it just getting the mentorship from those veterans or what else what other kind of things come out about because of it hopefully that's only only 20 percent of the value um is that mentor role it helps me to sell it Mm -hmm. and they have been there done that so they can ask really good questions and things But the members mostly learn from each other because they're in the trenches every day and and learning new marketing techniques or are seeing something new about best practices in hiring or sharing the, you know, mandatory sick leave stuff with each other that they learn about or whatever that looks like. Um, We said back when I first put some structure to this, which was literally like two years in before we had any mission, vision, values, anything. I actually like that. Um, (laughs) I guess we had (laughs) to That's how we started our business, man. Pure organic. Um, Perspective. Because you've got all those different personality types, you know, got the visionary, you got the engineer, and you got the, you know, the culture builder. So they're all asking questions from different perspectives. Um, accountability, um, because there's nobody to tell you what you do, what to do next when you're the owner and decider in a small business. Uh, you got uh, your partner at least helps, but yeah, yeah. But um, if you got a problem with your partner, who are you processing that right. question with? Right. You know, and so accountability. Hopefully not your wife, because that's just not that, going to have a fun night, that's right? A, so it's, it's, <laughs> it's loco think tank, a local community think tank. Mm-hmm. But it's also make you crazy if you don't talk to somebody about your business. Yeah. And make your spouse crazy. Man, sole proprietor, sole proprietors, I could just see jumping on this all day long. I, I think you made a good point about like the business partner, but then there's still a fault with that, right? In that, like, totally. yeah, I can, I can sure bounce stuff off Alex, and we talk about it all day long. But man, if you don't have that third leg, and I'm serious about, you don't want to take business home to your wife no. or your husband. So, yeah, yeah. They're, they're, when you ask them what you should do next, they're like, uh, make more money and find more time with me and the kids, yeah, exactly. you know, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So take the garbage out. So that accountability to do the things that you know you got to do, um, because you went through our process to to give some strength to that, and I'll describe that later. So perspective, accountability, and encouragement. Um, the sun doesn't always shine, you know, but, Mm -hmm. uh, so having somebody that says, you know, I I was, I was in a place like you six months ago and and I got through it and here's part of what saved me. So it's just kind of a positive peer pressure environment, um, where, you know, people don't have a dog in your fight, but they care about you so they can see things objectively, Yeah. but they get to know you over time, know who you are. Um, and it gets pretty powerful. Yeah. I believe that a hundred percent. Yeah. Let's 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 switch gears a little bit and talk about um, two two different two different way, versions of this. And one is challenges that you've seen common to all small businesses that you that you've interact with before COVID and after COVID. Hmm. So, like challenges common to all kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, people is sixty percent of what we talk about. How to hire the right people. How to train people to do the right things. You know, what kind of skills I need on my team. Things like that. Um, Certainly expense control uh, is important. A lot of small businesses aren't in it for the money in the first place. Mm-hmm. Their expenses keep rising and, and they're often scared to raise their prices. So the by far the most common advice I've given in my banking career and since then is raise your price, mm-hmm. raise your price, raise your price. Because you can't, can't keep that sustainable margin unless you do that. Right. Um, and then, uh, yeah, p- probably um, just... The importance of, of documenting your processes and setting the foundation to grow. Um, it's really, especially in the demographics that we work the most in, which is kind of that five to 20 employee small business is about, they're probably 60% of our members today or so. Um, they can get away with not documenting those processes and things superiorly, especially if they've got a stable staff. But if they want to grow to be a, a 40 person company, it's got to be done. And it's way easier yeah. to get it done now than it is later. Um, so that'd be pre-COVID and always, I'd say. Um, Post-COVID, you know, I think listening to their people um, is one thing that's been important, just both for, do you feel safe? Mm-hmm. Do you need to work from home? Mm-hmm. Do you, uh, y- you know, 
can we have the staff meeting at this time? Do you have any ideas for how we navigate? Um, we had a, an obstacles into opportunities conversation um, that resulted in a, uh, a weekly collaboration call that we had over 200 people sign on to over an eight week or 12 week span. Um, and that was uh, something that, that came from Rory during that op obstacles session. And, and I was kind of like, meh, does anybody really need this? It's going to be a lot of work. Yeah. And, and she got on the stump for it and just really said this is a good idea and, and I'll be damned if she wasn't right. Yeah. So uh, j listening to your people, it's always super important, but especially when you're navigating. And then uh, sharing with them and being vulnerable, you know. Uh, again, don't sugarcoat it. If, if you've got to make some layoffs, be sincere about it. If, if, uh, you know, if you want to talk to your team about, hey, either I have to lay three people off or we all have to go down to 60% exactly. pay. What do you guys want to do? Because um, I can't do it all, and I don't have the resources to be able to just pull us all through this right now. So, um, just that that vulnerability as the owner. You know, I mean, you still got to have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and it's don't be like, hey, I don't have any idea what we go from here. I just want to go and home and cry and hide yeah. <laughs> and stick my head in the <laughs> dirt. You know, it can't be that. We can do this, or we can do this, or we can do this. But I really value you guys and what you think we might do and and uh you know the the fearless leader um doesn't always inspire as much loyalty and trust as the leader that knows that they've got some opportunity to learn from their from their team uh as a former restaurateur and somebody who i you undoubtedly have have to have some people that are restaurant owners in these groups where do you see the future of, of this going, considering all the social distancing stuff? I mean, it obviously it is a very gray area. Right. You know, every, you know, the stock market is responding in really interesting ways. You'll hear like Pfizer yesterday, the stock market went on a run because there was a vaccine possibility, and but then it went down after you know other other results of unemployment. So like, how do you, how do you see this mm. this playing out? I mean, one of the things I've been telling uh, our staff is like, who is going to start a restaurant after this? But maybe I'm just too pessimistic about that. Yeah, well, I don't think I can answer that for the near term. I think longer term, I hope longer term that, that humankind ultimately is like, screw you, COVID. Like, I'm not going to sit six feet apart from everybody. I'm not going to not go to bars and meet somebody. You know, I'm not going to wear a mask for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, I'll do it right now so we can slow it down. And, you know, God willing that when they get a, a vaccine out, then the people that are fearful of this thing the take most, it. take that vaccine. Yep. I won't probably, but I'm not scared, you know, yep. and, and where I grew, where we grew up, you know, you, flu you, season was, was so, yeah, I was on the calendar, man. You get stuff and you die or you don't die and then you, life moves on. Yep. And I wish that was more people's approach to this. I, I, you know, I know it's been really bad in some yep. places. I'm not ignorant about that, but on the same token, I don't really like living in a place of fear uh, we're the we're the bosses. The humans are the bosses of the world. So let's not let this bug be the owner of it. So I hope and believe that within twelve months or something like that, there will be enough solutions out there that we don't have to wear these stupid. Yeah, masks I'm with you. I, I want to be. I, yeah, even though I had that pessimism, I mean, it's you know, it's an easy thought. I think the pessimism is an easy thought to have. I think the hard thought is always to, and thought process is always to be an, be an optimist because it takes more effort. Um, for some people, anyway. I can't help it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's just natural, yeah. Um, but, and if you're a business dude, like, you are an optimist because you believe you can grow your business and yourself. Uh, one other, one thing that I think maybe would, would be good to talk about that I, I could see Loco Think Tank doing and helping people out is exposing their blind spots hmm. and then giving them some perspective on that, right? Because you don't know what you don't know until you, until you finally know it. Talk about that. Um, I can tell a story from five years ago last month that yeah. about myself that illustrates that. And it'll, it'll also allow me to unpack our process for you, too. Our kind of key uh, low collaboration process, we call it. So um, it's four steps. The first step is set the stage. Um, in my case, I was food trucking. I never did get a restaurant off the ground, but mm -hmm. I ran a food truck uh, or food trailer catering business. So we were an event caterer, not like a brewery's place necessarily. We, we went there to hope to get a, sure. a wedding in the park or a company picnic whatever. So I, I had uh, grown the business um, from like 40,000 the first year, all told, and I was already up to about 80,000 in, in June. But I was working 70 hours a week Man. And, and maybe bringing a thousand or two home to the bottom line. And, uh, you know, had a lot of good events, had a lot of abject failures. 
And so the question I brought to my group was, um, should I get this second food trailer? I had bought another trailer that would be able to be like sidewalk things and, and stuff. Should I get this licensed and non operation and would it cost me a few thousand dollars and some brain damage so that I can increase my total revenues? Because I'm, I'm whipping this pony about as hard as I can, but it's only so big of a unit and I got to make more revenues if I'm going to have a, a decent bottom line at the end of the day. So that's, that was the stage. I set the stage, revealed my financials, talked about the kinds of events and all that, what my purposes were for adding this new tool, um, and wound up with that question. That's our process. Just one simple question. Should I get the second trailer going? Um, second step is, is clarifying questions, no suggestions. Um, and so now the presenter quietly sits except to answer questions from these other 10 members in the room or 12. And so the questions that I remember best were, and these people had been with me about 16 months by now. Um, hey, Kurt, you're a pretty social guy. Um, how do you like always working when all your friends have time off and always having time off when your friends are working? And it's like, well, shut up. <laughs> 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 and, and you're creative. We, we yeah. know you're a creative guy and you love food and yeah. making all different kinds of Boy, things. Boy, they really and turned stuff. a flashlight on you there. <laughs> but um, how do you like making the same kind of food over and over and over again? Interesting. And uh, the last one that I really remember was I was the president of the board of a local nonprofit, the Matthews House. Mm -hmm. um, shout out to the Matthews House. It's awesome. Um, but, and I was an advocate for fundraising and this and that, but I didn't have any time or money to support local philanthropic causes, not just them, but others. And so how do you, how do you like not having any time or money for that? And you know that if you get a restaurant and two food trailers going, you're, you're not going to have any time or money for that stuff either, right? Mm -hmm. And I was like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they could see me more clearly yeah. than I could Objectively. see myself. Objectively yeah, because too. they're not, I was focused, uh, in retrospect, mm -hmm. I was focused on not failing at what I was working on. And right. I think men especially get single-minded in that way. We're very A to B. We're very, we're I don't a lot of us are stubborn. care if it's the right thing. Yep. I'm going to do it and either suffer or find joy in having done it. And we'll go from there. But mm -hmm. they basically said, and the first, so then step three is suggested solutions. Okay. And uh, the, the two that uh, usually we'll get like a board full of 12 or something. Um, and then step four is to be accountable to which of those 12. You can't leave with 12 things to do, but leave with three or four things that you can do and be accountable over. Um, and the two things that really came out of that suggestion list were... Um, my current landlord is the, the founder of Chiba Hut, Scott Jennings. And Scott said, Bear, oh, cool. you need to park that freaking thing in your backyard and go get a job. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I think it was him, it might have been another member that said, and, and get a job that's flexible enough that you can work on local think tank. Because mm -hmm. you're clearly more passionate about local think tank. It's way more scalable. Like, you maybe could create a thirty or $40,000 a year income in a couple of years out of this thing, but you made way more than twice that before and yeah. that's just dumb. You're not going to enjoy it even if you make it successful. So why keep pedaling? And uh, so I hired a coach to kind of help me look into myself and what I could do and, and thought about trying to scale Think Tank fast enough, but I, I made like 500 bucks a month off of each. I had two chapters back then and that wasn't going to cut it. So I um, got a job in investments and insurance and, and grew Think Tank on the side until 2018. So that's our process, and yep. that's like a, just an example of how you just don't see yourself very clearly. I, I like to think we're like all looking through binoculars, you know, and back at a, you can't see back at yourself very easy sometimes. One hundred percent, yeah. You, sometimes the mirror the mirror is necessary for sure. That I guess that's maybe one of the things that I, that that when I look at you know when I look at a, a, a project and and a company and, and this organization that you formed. To me, that's obviously one of the big one of the big positives of totally. it. Exactly, is is that you you get out of your little echo chamber. It's a, there's a sounding board, and you, and you can start to maybe see these blind spots because somebody exposes them. I mean, your story was very funny because of that. <laughs> <laughs> right, thank you. Well, and and we talk about industry think. Like if you get together with other architects on a regular basis yeah. and talk about how they're doing this and how they're doing that, that's great. It's really useful, and there's peer advisory models out there that are just about that. Um, they meet like far away regionally. But they get industry think. And so you might learn something just totally amazing from a restaurateur in a chapter or from a wholesaler. And you're like, oh, I can actually apply that to my architecture business and nobody else is doing that and it's going to be great. And I don't know what that is. I'm making it right. up. But, yep. but yeah, you just get out of your, out of your bubble. 
Totally. For sure. Yeah, yeah, it's necessary. Um, you got a little, a couple words here that really st- stood out to me um, in some of your notes that you sent over before we started recording. And, and I, I really like this uh, just because I think it's an intriguing two words put together. It's profit guilt. Mm. Um, and uh, it's, I actually have a very, uh, uh, there's a specific question that I have regarding that. And that is, you know, I would love to hear from you about other, bi- if you've, if you've, if you've had other business owners that s- somehow have this idea of profit guilt, I've never been felt guilty for it, but so maybe there's some specific examples you give us with that, but the larger perspective of capitalism, in my opinion, is under attack. I think actually the mm. word capitalism um, is seen in a negative connotation. As a matter of fact, my wife was reading something. I can't remember where it was from. Some some publication, maybe like at The Atlantic, one of those kind, right. uh, what I would consider a rag. And they <laughs> they said, <laughs> they said uh, that, you know, they just did this study of like capitalism if you use that word, it's bad connotation, right? You think of the, you know, this lar- the larger society sees it like there's this greedy uh, pig of a capitalist behind everything, just pushing the labor down and, and get, maximizing their profit and work till they're, you know, make everybody work till they're, till they're bleeding and stuff like that versus the term free market sure. or free enterprise. Right. Um, so if you could speak to the macro and the micro of that from your perspective of, and I know you're, you're a libertarian, I am too, and a free thinker, and like where, do you know, are we in late stage capitalism? Where do you see all of this headed? Yeah, it's a really thoughtful question. Um, so I'll talk to the micro first in that, that profit guilt. And, and the capitalists, the big capitalists, you know, the corporations and stuff especially don't have profit guilt. They have profit obligations and, yep, and short-sightedness so that they're, you know, can't look beyond the next quarter because of it in some cases and everything. So, but, but small business owners are, are usually more in it for the passion. They're the innovators. They're the job creators, you know, and, and to some extent, I think the, the tool of government is manipulated by those big guys. 100% cronyism. To, to keep day. the little guys down. Yep. Like this new bullshit seven days six days paid vacation thing for any business yeah you know 16 and under in colorado and over in colorado you know that's just it's so hard to get a small business off the launch pad what i tell people is you need a pile of money access to a pile of money and a really good idea and it's really hard to get a pile of money a good idea and and so the the more obstacles you make to that the harder it becomes so i i hope that over time local think tank can can even develop resources to help provide capital even to some of these businesses. But so profit guilt exists because people don't necessarily always understand margins and, and just the value proposition and, and what, you know, if somebody wants to pay more for your product and they feel good about that, then, then let them, you know? And so Mm -hmm. I would say that it's, uh, it's especially for those, those operator business people that, that the market wants more and more of their business and, and they, they work themselves into the ground and they, they don't want to raise their price because they've both got some fear about that, but also because they don't want to take advantage of anybody, you know, that kind of thing. So I just coach around that in terms of how to be sustainable. Like, you ha- if you want to, do you want to serve more people? Do you believe in your product? Do you think that your product makes people's lives better? Well, then the only way you can do that is to be profitable save some of that profit, don't pay yourself all of that profit out and, and grow your team, grow your enterprise, grow your inventory offerings, whatever that thing is that you're doing, the only way that you can make more of an impact is to grow. And, and that's the same with a nonprofit organization. They're like, oh, I can't make profit, I'm a nonprofit. Well, you can't grow if you don't make profit. You don't have to call a profit, you put it in a bank and then exactly. you can hire more people and serve more people and do more good things. Mm-hmm. So stop it. Sorry, I'm getting a little agitated. That's a, no, no, that's good. <laughs> no, no, I love it. Um, but then there is... You know, basically, the crony capitalism almost, yeah. uh, certainly in the, and, and just corporate greed, mm-hmm. you know, and I think if we could do one thing to um, help uh, adjust the culture and values of our nation, it's to kind of get that thought of that corporations only exist for one purpose, and that's to maximize profit. Get that out of our heads. You know, you exist to, to give good jobs for your employees you exist to not to to pay your board members stupid ridiculous amounts not to approve each other's gigantic salaries you know being a libertarian i i i hesitate strongly to to use the tool of government to fight these huge corporations but maybe we have to break up some monopolies and things like that to get a stick i'd love to see companies willingly enter into a hey, we'll not pay the CEO uh, more than 
a hundred times the yeah. average wage of this corporation or something like that. And, and nobody less than half of the average wage of this corporation or something. I don't know. And, and, and let the marketplace decide, you know, because people vote with their, with their dollars. Oh, look at this. Uh, you know, whatever this laundry detergent company is, is their, their new CEO is only making a third of what the last one was. And he put this pledge into place about getting the wages for their average person up and this and that. We don't need more multi, 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 multi millionaires in the country. We need more middle class. And in the end, if if those corporations that are so focused on just strict bottom line would try to share more of the of the love with their staff and 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 healthcare has been a big problem. You yeah. know, they're paying more and more and more for that. So there's fixes in that realm. But um, so I think you know, it, it's it's. Even all the all the race stuff going on and stuff, it's all about values and individual actions. How can we make our individualized actions line up with the values that we can share as a nation? And and can we get the values of of these gigantic corporations, especially, to be more resonant? You know, like the Facebooks and and Googles of the world and stuff. They're like the bosses of the world right now. Hundred percent. Not just the the executives, but all those people that make four or five hundred thousand dollars a year doing stuff for google whatever that stuff they're is the modern day robber barons totally yep. totally and they're just a, they're just skimming a s- significant amount of the productive labor out of the society you know they're not creating any shelter they're not creating any food they're creating a, a wasteful service that sucks people's time away from things that they could be doing spending time with their family or building a new building attending a garden yeah you know so stop it stop your gross and um yeah anyway Exactly. So that's that's where I was hoping you would go with with that kind of macro answer. Was it's Mark Cuban is a pretty big ad, ad, advocate of this idea that we need to have compassionate capitalism, and for me for me what that means is exactly the things you're saying is like yeah. it's got there's got to be some voluntarism here injected in this. Totally. Yeah. And, and yeah for, tell me to do something, and I probably won't. Ask me if I might do something to help somebody or volunteer to help somebody, then I will. You know, if you're going to raise my taxes to put in a bunch of programs that are probably going to do more harm than good trying to fix the inner cities and whatever, no, I'm out. But set me up a a successful business incubator and and values and culture enhancer for these inner city environments that have faced nothing but, but strife and desperation. I'll donate to that. I'll donate twice as much as the taxes you want to raise if you convince me that it's right. working enough, but it won't work if you're government and you try to put that into place. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, to, su- to kind of sum that up, I guess the way I would sum that sum it all up is that cap- capitalists need need to ensure that they keep capitalism going. It's up to them. It's not it's not fighting back against like the socialists or the progressives or anything like that. I think it is purely like you need to just look within yourself as a business owner, how mm. big or big, small, and you need lead, lead by example totally. um, in the way you treat your employees, the way you treat your customers, and then the way you ideally give back like you're talking about. Yeah. I call um, myself a compassionate libertarian, and uh, a lot of my leftist friends are like, there's no such thing. I'm like, whatever. I, it's pure I, voluntary. I guarantee you I donate more to charity <laughs> as a percentage of my income than you do. I drive an electric car. I, you know, raise chickens so I don't have to throw vegetable scraps in my trash. Whatever. I'm just as compassionate as you are. I just don't think government's the right way to fix the world. Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, what's uncompassionate is asking government to coerce people to do things. Whereas, you know, like you just talked about, the the voluntary stuff is where it's at. Well, that's our, my my motto for a a few years before I started Loco and our first kind of value is uh, ask of your needs and share of your abundance. I love it. And uh, I just hang a lot of things on that culturally wise mm-hmm. um we're, we're kind of getting a little deep here and i'd like to go just one step further and then i've got one last question for you and that is uh you know you seem like a a traveler and i don't mean like actually physically going even though you came down from fort collins and stuff i mean a, just a traveler of business just a traveler of meeting people connecting people growing people so what does that mean for you for you know your search for purpose and, and meaning as kurt as kurt bear Wow, that's a, and I am, I'm a traveler as well. We took a 4,700 mile uh, RV trip, my wife and I, with our exchange student at the end of June. We uh, called it the Free and Empty National Parks Tour. Cool. <laughs> we were at Grand that's Canyon. That's hilarious. We were at Grand Canyon with like <laughs> 50 empty. people. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> Yellowstone was the only place that wasn't free and wasn't empty. It was oh, pretty no busy kidding. up there, yeah. Yeah, in Wyoming, the Wyoming part yeah, of yeah. Wyoming? Yeah, yeah, West Yellowstone is where we yeah. came in. Um, but, so let's see, the question was really about purpose and, yeah, I, 
I definitely am. I'm a. I like to say I'm an inch deep and a mile wide, uh, like the Red River Valley, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if you flood it a little bit, uh, um, but I know a little bit about almost everything that I can imagine. Um, you know, in high school, I started reading Wall Street Journal, U.S. News and World Report, and a couple other magazines like cover to cover every week. Wow. Uh, and so. I've just always been super curious about all the things and all the people, and I want to hear your story. And so, and my, my wife and I have been married for 17 years. Shout out to Jill Bear. Mm-hmm. Um, and we don't have any kids, just fur babies. And so, the local is my legacy in, in a lot of ways. It's the one thing that I hope that will live on after my years are gone, and I hope it keeps adding value to the world long after I'm warm food. And uh, so, there's a lot of purpose in me just to help expand that. And these facilitators, like they just get so much joy from having a purpose fulfilling role again and, and earning a little income. You know, they they're capitalists too. They saved all their money. They did the retirement account. They got, but to to get just walking around money that you've earned again after you've kind of retired, they they love that too. I bet. Um, I, dozens and dozens of transformational stories about businesses that were okay and now they're great, or they were good and now they're awesome. So there's there's some of that. Um, so the, the dream, uh, for me over the next like three or four years is that I can build a team at Loco that can really process all the, the membership growth obligations and things and, and match member prospects to facilitators wherever we can find them in the first in the front range. Cause I want to be able to support those chapters, but eventually all over. Um, and then I'll get to, uh, have a sprinter camper van and, and go on long trips with my wife and meet the people that would like to be facilitators. And my job will shift from being the picker of the members to really being the curator of that facilitator corpse over time and just building building and having relationships with those people and, and other influencers and just kind of, you know, encouraging everybody everywhere to, to use some of their skill, experience, and, and hopefully eventually even their capital. I'd love to have Loco develop a mechanism where we can let our facilitators and members pull some of their capital off of Wall Street and put it onto Main Street. Sure. And uh, take some of that place that banks used to fill with helping people to grow their businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, now unless you're a kind of a, you know, a bigger business already, 10, 20 employees and a, three years of history and whatever, there isn't much capital available to I, you very yeah. easily. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. yeah. What a beautiful path you set yourself on. I'm excited. And I wish you all the best of luck. Your story has been really inspiring. Um, I feel a deep personal connection here with the gardening, the 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 politics the free thinking just the entrepreneurialism um the chickens i have chickens too i do Mm -hmm. i do a lot of the same things you do buddy um so i got one last question for you and that is if you could go back in time knowing what you know now what would you first tell yourself for advice when starting loco think tank hmm and that always puts people on the spot so no that's a good question um you know, if I had started putting more structure to it sooner, mm-hmm. we'd be farther ahead now. Um, if I would have, you know, gone full time on it when I first quit the food business, that probably would have saved me a lot of consternation as well. Um, it, it would have been hard. Um, and I might have had to take a Uber driver job or uh, something like that just to yep. to get through. But I, I probably would have moved move to do the important things for building the the organizational development of local think tank sooner uh you know the defining of our values and mission and things like that we have have characteristics of our members and characteristics of our facilitators and and that stuff has developed over time and and uh but like just don't wait i think that's for me you know advice to myself but also to anybody listening is if you got this thing that you know you should do or want to do to develop your business enterprise operation Oh, by the way, I, I love the word free enterprise. Like instead of capitalism, I want to use free enterprise as that term Do more it. because yeah. it, we love free enterprise. And if you Who don't love free enterprise, get out of my house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, that's, that's where I'd go with that is just do, no reason to wait. Do yeah. the things that you need to do. If you, if you, you know, pull the bandaid off, it's going to be hard, you know, doing those. And that's that accountability thing at Loco, you know, okay. You said you're going to do three or four things uh, before next month's meeting. Don't show up next month and say, I didn't do those things because it was hard. Say, it was hard and I did those things. Thanks yeah. for encouraging me. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Uh, Kurt, it was an absolute pleasure. Where can people, if they want to connect with you, if they want to find you, if they want to, if they want to get in touch with you, where can, where can they do that? Um, our website's a good place to start. We've got uh, newsletter, phone numbers, all that stuff, and it's just loco, L-O-C-O, think tank, 
dot com. Um, 970-698-6977, I think, is the nice. official office number. It goes to my cell phone, which is, well, I won't say that one right yeah. now. But, uh, but that's the phone number there. And then, uh, you know, we've got a Facebook page, of course. Um, I'm a, I'm a loco noco bear on Instagram. It's nothing about loco think tank, but there's pictures of my dog and food and travel stuff. And then LinkedIn. Oh, and LinkedIn. That's how you, so you and I got Yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm very popular on LinkedIn. Good deal. Um, uh, and uh, so you can track me down there. Beautiful. All right. Thanks again, Kurt. It's been fun. Thank you, Lance. <laughs>